Good afternoon and welcome to our session on STI screening and treatment. I'm Marwan Haddad and I'm the medical director of the Center for Key Populations at Community Health Center, Inc. in under uh, which we have the Ryan White B and C programs. Hi there, my name is Megan Garcia. I'm a family nurse practitioner and I work at the Community Health Center, both for our Center for Key Populations and as a primary care provider. Hey everyone, my name is Jeannie McIntosh. Um, I'm also a family nurse practitioner and HIV specialist with the Center for Key Populations program. Hi all, I'm Stephanie Farrell. I'm a registered nurse. I work with our Center for Key Populations as a nurse care coordinator for all of these providers. All right, so we have no disclosures. And so uh, the learning objectives for this presentation uh, are that by the end, we hope that you will be able to summarize the evidence-based research on STI self-collection and how that fits into the model of FQHCs. Um, we want to make sure that uh, hopefully by the end, you will list some of the barriers that can be encountered with STI screening uh, to describe how the sexual risk assessment could be streamlined for adoption into a clinic visit, uh, to review the success of CHC's own pilot demonstration project uh, that we did in self-collection and the lessons learned from patients uh, in implementation. Uh, and lastly, to understand ways to increase access to care for STIs by using nurse-led initiatives in the clinic setting. So first, who are we? Uh, we're Community Health Center, Inc., or CHC, and we are one of the largest federally qualified health centers in the nation. We have about 14 health center sites throughout the state of Connecticut and serve about 100,000 patients a year. Regarding the Center for Key Populations, uh, it is the first center of its kind focusing on key groups who experience health disparities secondary to stigma and discrimination. Uh, so we at CKP, we bring healthcare training, research and advocacy for people who use drugs, the LGB and transgender populations, the homeless, the recently incarcerated and sex workers. And under the purview of CKP falls a number of programs, including our HIV program, hepatitis C, our medication assisted treatment and substance use disorder programs, as well as LGBT health. All right, so why should we care about STIs? Well, the first, the rates of STIs in the US continue to rise. And uh, uh, there were around 1.8 million cases of chlamydia in 2018, according to the CDC, which, um, is, uh, which was a 5% sort of uh, increase from the previous year. Uh, sorry, 3% increase from the previous year. Uh, about two thirds of these cases were in women and the majority under the age of 25. So similarly, gonorrhea cases increased by 5% from 2017 with around 583,000 cases and syphilis increased 14% to 115,000 cases. These were mainly men. The majority uh, uh, were men who have sex with men and half of the men with syphilis were also living with HIV. Now, unfortunately and not surprisingly, SDIs disproportionately affected racial and ethnic minorities. So the following rates in 2018 are compared to whites. So for chlamydia, the rates in black women were five times that of white women, and black men about seven times, and Hispanics about twice as high. For gonorrhea, black women had rates about seven times as high as white women, black men 8.5 times as high, and Hispanics around 1.6. Similarly for syphilis, blacks had rates about five times as high, and Hispanics twice as high, and these were even higher for congenital syphilis. So in looking at men of sex with men and extra genital infections, the prevalence is estimated to be about 7% for pharyngeal gonorrhea and around 5% uh, for rectal gonorrhea. And for chlamydia, it was just over 2% for pharyngeal and about 9% for rectal. So why were we interested in STIs in Connecticut? Um, you can see here, uh, next slide. So why were we interested in STIs in Connecticut? You can see here that the rates of STIs in Connecticut, like in the US, also increased dramatically. 
And these are rates since 2014. And you can see here the 27% increase in chlamydia, 67% increase in gonorrhea, and 75% increase in syphilis. So the CDC recommends that primary care settings should offer STD services. And that screening should include gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and HIV, among others. Um, and that the lab services that we provide should use nucleic acid amplification tests, or NAT, for urogenital as well as extragenital gonorrhea and chlamydia screenings. Uh, should also include both tryponemal and non-tryponemal serologic tests for syphilis and fourth generation tests for HIV. CDC specifically recommends pharyngeal and rectal screening in MSM, given the extragenital prevalence rates in this population. However, we also know that there exist multiple barriers to screening, in particular rectal screening, which include access to care, stigma, and discrimination. And regarding access, given there's been decreased funding to STI clinics across the nation, we really need to start providing increased access to STI screening and treatment in primary care settings, much like community health centers and Ryan White clinics. So in turning and looking at self-collection and its benefits, a 2016 study showed that in a cohort of MSM over a year, if rectal testing was not done, over 70% of chlamydia and 80% of gonorrhea would have been missed. And in a 2019 meta-analysis, it showed that self-collection increased the uptake of STI testing relative to clinician collection. And uh, self-collection as a tool helps overcome barriers associated with stigma in MSM and trans women. Um, it's preferred by patients and has been shown to be equally, if not more effective than clinician collection. And there was also one study that was done in a Ryan White clinic looking at nurse-led sexually transmitted uh, infection screening program, uh, which included self-collection. And that showed that a nurse-led program increased screening rates significantly, though there were still missed opportunities. Uh, and it showed that extragenital gonorrhea and chlamydia prevalence rates were consistent with the national rates, and that all men of sex with men found the self-collection acceptable. So given all of this, uh, we at CHC came together and we examined what barriers we saw when it came to SDI screening. And we broke these down into patient, provider, and organization levels. So for the patient level, of course, stigma and discomfort were at the top of the list. Um, access, such as transportation and work and home responsibilities, as well as the time delay to getting an appointment, even if it was just a day or two. Um, confidentiality and privacy concerns also came up. And then given the diversity in our patient population, uh, we also knew that we had to consider the cultural differences and sensitivities when it comes to discussing sexual health. For the provider level, again, stigma and discrimination uh, that we as a profession bring to the table was at the top of the list. Um, of course, the discomfort that many providers feel when it comes to taking an intimate history and exam, as well as the need in many clinics to have a chaperone with an intimate examination. And another barrier, of course, is the time constraint that we keep hearing about over and over again, uh, that given providers only have 15 to 20 minutes for a visit to address so many competing issues, how are they gonna be able to fit in STI screening and testing as well? And then the lack of knowledge when it comes to the need for extra genital testing. On the organization level, there was a general lack of awareness and training of staff when it came to STI education, screening and testing. Uh, the general clinic culture just had too many competing priorities with a lack of emphasis on STIs as a significant and important quality measure. So we decided to do a few things to start and to try to overcome some of these barriers. So training staff on the importance of STI screening we knew was gonna be key. And so we presented the plan of launching a streamlined sexual risk assessment and training to the agency's medical QI and performance improvement committees, where most of our senior leadership attend. And as I mentioned, we also focused in on streamlining the sexual risk assessment to make it less daunting and more functional as part of a busy clinic workflow. We decided also to do a small demonstration project for rectal self-collection in order for us to plan for a wider adoption across the agency. 
Um, given the known high rates of STIs among women, especially chlamydia, and that pharyngeal testing was recommended for MSM, uh, so Megan Garcia, who was our CKP fellow at the time, was interested in doing a small pilot study in pharyngeal testing in high-risk women. And then the last thing we'll talk about today is our initiative in establishing nurse visits for STI screening to help improve access and uptake of STI testing. So, as we know, what's recommended to be included in a complete sexual risk assessment are the five Ps, right? So partners, practices, past history of STDs, protection from STDs, as well as pregnancy plans. And as we also know, collecting all this information, as valuable as it is, is usually quite extensive, very time consuming, and therefore seldom done. So we really asked ourselves, what is it exactly that we need to know in order to make a determination of what type of STI screening and education will be needed? So we came up with six essential questions. And here they are, right? So have you ever had any type of sex, oral, vaginal, anal? When was the last time, uh, when was the last time you had sex? Are partners men, women, trans men, trans women? And how many, one or more than one? Do you use condoms or are you on PrEP? And is it always, sometimes or never? Are you experiencing any symptoms now? And were you exposed to any STDs that you know? And so we created a template for our EHR that you can see here. And we have drop downs that provided the relevant information and some guidance regarding what to consider for STI testing and discussion. So prompting, for example, to discuss PrEP or to perform extra genital testing. We made it also so that if you had the time, you could get a bit more granular and ask, for example, about condom use for oral, vaginal, and anal sex. Or if you don't have as much time, you can just input in general the condom use was it used sometimes, always, or never. And here you can see that we also list out symptoms to guide providers if, if needed. And lastly, you can see here the example of a sexual risk assessment taken on a man who has sex with men. And you can see how streamlined that can be, right? So you can see here that this is a man who has sex with men, has more than one partner. He gives and receives both oral and anal sex, sometimes uses condoms, but is on PrEP, uh, doesn't have any symptoms currently, and doesn't have any exposures that he knows of. And so with this information, we know uh, almost immediately we do need to do uh, all the testing regarding HIV and syphilis, but also to, uh, and gonorrhea and chlamydia, but also to add the extra genital gonorrhea and chlamydia uh, testing as well. So now I will turn it over to Jeannie to discuss our demonstration project on the self-collection. All right, so as uh, Dr. Haddad had previously mentioned, one of our other strategies to addressing barriers in STI screening is to promote rectal and vaginal self-swabbing at our clinic. And to this end, we conducted a small study um, to assess uh, patient and provider comfort and preference surrounding um, rectal self-collection. Um, Dr. Haddad was the one who conducted the study and then several clinicians, uh, myself included, offered participation uh, to our patients. And so here I'll just summarize the study characteristics and some of the results. Um, so 33 patients total were included in the study, um, both men who have sex with men and trans women um, who were due for STI screening. Uh, the mean age of participants was 40 years old with a range of 19 to 59 years old. Um, the racial ethnic demographic breakdown was 39% white, 18% Black, 39% Hispanic, and 3% other. 70% um, of the participants identified as gay or lesbian, 6% as bisexual, 6% as straight, 9% other, and 9% chose not to disclose. Um, and lastly, 79% of the participants were cis male, 15% uh, trans female, and 6% chose uh, not to disclose. So of all these patients, um, they were offered rectal self-collection or clinician collection. Um, informed consent was then obtained. Um, for those who opted for self-collection, written instructions were given and reviewed, and then a survey questionnaire was filled out at the end. All right, so um, 
here I'll go on to summarize the results. Um, all of the patients agreed that the instructions were easy to follow, um, either agree or somewhat agree. Um, and all also, or um, it was 31, 31 total agreed that it was easy to swab their own bottoms, um, two were neutral. And um, all agreed or somewhat agreed that they felt comfortable swabbing their own bottoms. Um, and um, the majority reported that they did not feel pain when swabbing their own bottoms. Um, we had um, um, a couple of neutral and um, neutral responses and some who did experience some pain. Um, but this would need to be con uh, compared to provider collection of the rectal swab um, to assess pain um, in that case as well. All right, so um, all of the participations reported that they felt comfortable asking questions about swabbing their own bottom. And most importantly, given a choice, 70% um, of the participants reported that they would prefer to swab their own bottoms. 30% um, reported not having a preference, and um, none reported preferring to have a, a provider swab their bottom. Um, and so given that these results were really promising, we've gone on to um, roll out offering self-swab collection more widely at our clinic. Um, we do think that there's still a place for provider collection. For example, if there's a rectal or perianal in, uh, complaint that requires examination or concomitant um, rectal pap collection, but definitely for routine um, STI screening, um, rectal self-swab collection seems like a viable option. And I'm now going to turn it over to Megan, who's going to be talking about her, um, her pilot study. So just as we've talked already a lot about the idea of looking for extragenital STI infections, we were thinking that we need to also think about oropharyngeal infection in women and trans men. We know that infection is often asymptomatic at any of these sites. And so as we're seeing a continual rise in STIs in, you know, across the nation, we should be aware that we need to be checking many different sites extragenitally. Um, however, there are still no current guidelines on extragenital screening in women. So we, we did a small pilot study, so this is preliminary data, with uh, the following objectives. So the number one objective was to determine the rate of gonorrhea and chlamydia in women and trans, trans men who are sexually active and under the age of 25 or those age 25 or older that had additional risk factors. So this actually follows uh, the CDC guidelines for when we should do urogenital screening in these populations. So we used those criteria um, as inclusion criteria for the study. We also wanted to correlate the rate of oropharyngeal gonorrhea and chlamydia infections with the urogenital results obtained within the last year among the study population. So essentially we wanted to know if someone has a urogenital infection are we likely or are we going to find an oropharyngeal infection or vice versa? In other words, if we're only testing urogenitally, are we missing infections in the oropharynx that could possibly be driving um, uh, the epidemic or serving as a reservoir? And then finally, we'd like to compare these results or these rates uh, with the organizational and national rates of oropharyngeal infection in MSM and trans women. Because as we know, in MSM, there are some extragenital uh, screening guidelines, one of which is to check for oropharyngeal gonorrhea, although many clinicians are already checking for oropharyngeal gonorrhea and chlamydia. So we wanted to compare uh, women and MSM. So again, it was a, it was a small study. Uh, we, I used the most current CDC guidelines for as inclusion criteria. So um, it was for, we included any sexually active female under the age of 25. Okay. But also we included anyone over age 25 with risk factors, which could be, uh, or which include those who have a new sex partner and more with more than one sex partner, a sex partner with uh, concurrent partners or a sex partner who has a sexually transmitted infection. And then all, 
also in the context of the study, they also have to practice or um, to practice or to have practiced oral sex. So we offered the oral pharyngeal gonorrhea and chlamydia, chlamydia testing at the time of other STI screenings, uh, and we uh, obviously obtained an informed consent. The mean age was 33 with an age range of 18 to 55. We had 25 total participants so far, and eight of those participants were women under 25, which is consistent with the sort of the blanket uh, CDC guidelines for your genital testing in, in women under age 25. So all 25 women had pharyngeal swabs done and were resulted. 24 of the 25 had urogenital uh, tests collected and resulted. Basically, um, those that we looked at that also had HIV and syphilis tests done, all of those were negative, except for there were two women that were participants in the study who were known to be living with HIV. We can advance the slide. And so out of 25 women, three of the 25 women had a positive chlamydia result. So we didn't find any positive gonorrhea results so far. Of those three women, one had a positive urogenital uh, result and one had a negative pharyngeal result. One had a positive pharyngeal result and a negative urogenital result. And then finally, one woman had a positive pharyngeal and urogenital chlamydia uh, result. So essentially 8% were positive for pharyngeal chlamydia and 8% were positive for, your, for urogenital chlamydia. Obviously, this is preliminary. We need more data to understand the utility of extragenital testing in women and trans men, but I think it is interesting to consider that we are routinely uh, checking uh, your uh, oropharyngeal for MS MSM for gonorrhea. We know that the throat can be a reservoir for these infections, it can be asymptomatic. And we also know that oral sex may be considered to be less risky. Um, some people may be practicing oral sex without other kinds of sex. Um, and so it's important to think of this as a, as, a, as a place that we should be testing routinely. So it'll be interesting to look at more or gather more data to see uh, you know, if, this, if this offers any better idea of how we can continue to further extragenital testing in women. Thanks, Megan. Um, all of that being said, there's a lot to be done in a little amount of time. One of the things that we've done with community health centers really leverage the nursing role and uh, having your nurses work at the top of their licensure as partners with the provider, as well as the patient has gone um, quite far for us. The collaboration between providers and nurses has been key to the success of us rolling out nursing visits in several areas across the agency. Nurses at the heart of everything they do, it's uh, patient-centered, patient education is such a huge part of what we're doing. So cultivating on that relationship that's already been built, you know, uh, provider has results and nurse is calling the provider, or calling the patient to review the results. So they're, they've gotten used to talking to us. We have these conversations and we continue to have the conversations and we roll out nursing visits where they can come in and meet with us and we can go over different things um, in terms of education, testing, many, many different things that we can do along with the patient as part of the, clinic, the clinical team and having that a special time that we can with the patient one-on-one -on -one to build on those provider conversations that are happening uh, across the board. We've also, uh, through the Center for Key Populations, we've identified nurses who really act as champions and leverage the education um, and work on the expertise in their nursing practice. And other nurses throughout the agency know that they can come to these nurses, myself included, to, to ask for help, to ask for guidance, and really to spread that knowledge. Nursing visits can come from a, a few different ways. The provider might, uh, Dr. Haddad might send me a message and say, can you please do a nurse visit with this patient? And this is what I want you to discuss. This is what we're going over. We do also have standing orders for a variety of different things, um, issues that can be discussed at visits. And we're hoping to expand those as we move forward. 
all of the um, the five P's, the sexual health assessment that Dr. Haddad spoke of, that's a lot of time. And the provider might not have the time to go over all of that information within their the constraints of their visit. So working with the nurse and the patient, we, we can kind of break it down. We might obtain some of the information as much as we can in these visits, um, identifying things as we go, bringing that up to the provider, uh, discussing risk factors with the patients as we're moving through obtaining this information. And we might chunk it up and do this over several visits, um, really building on the trust and the relationship as we move through these visits. We can also, in, this, um, in the nursing visits, we can also do testing. Uh, there are standing orders. We can do the urine and the pharyngeal swab collections at direction from the providers. We do have education that we can provide, written education that we can review and provide if the provider directs us to obtain, have the patient do the self-collection and they're comfortable, they wanna do that at the direction of the provider, we can help them and do that within the nursing visit. And always, 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 we can do the HIV rapid testing and we're continually looking at dashboards that we have for our um, patients across the board where we're working on keeping that up to date and reviewing the labs as they go within the nursing visits. That includes the lab orders, uh, staying up to date with labs that are needed, HIV, syphilis, um, hep C, hep B, Vaccinations are always have been really where maybe that was the foundation of the nurse visit originally, how it organically evolved, but vaccinations are reviewed by the nurses uh, prior to provider visits and then as well at nurse visits, really having that education and uh, maybe you might have someone who's resistant to an immunization, but we continue to work at it and then we watch to make sure that they stay up to date and get the complete series done. Like I had said before, patient education and counseling is such an important part and really builds on that trust that we've worked on with the patient um, and the provider, trusting that their nurse is going to be able to have the conversation and the patient trusting that the nurse is coming with their best interest at heart. We can discuss PrEP, condom distribution is always Part of what I what we're doing, I always have a box of condoms behind me and offer it to everyone. Condom for everyone. Um, that being said, 2020 has led to some challenges. And uh, Jeannie, can you kind of share how we're addressing that? Yes. So, given that we are doing this presentation in the midst of the COVID pandemic, we felt that we would be remiss in not um, bringing up some of the challenges and opportunities um, related to STI screening um, and counseling and treatment in the age of COVID. Um, so, first, I'll talk about some of the challenges. You can see that telehealth is listed as both a challenge and opportunity. Um, so, we'll be discussing it twice. Um, the first is potential privacy concerns around telehealth. Um, I'm sure that a lot of the listeners are also um, providing most of their patient visits right now through phone or video. And many of our patients are calling from home, from work, and places where it might be a little bit harder to duck away and find some private space to talk about sexual health. Um, and so that's a potential challenge. Um, another challenge is that, um, you know, we often reach patients for STI screening and HIV screening through large community outreach events, which have essentially come to a halt, um, you know, as large gatherings are, are um, meant to be avoided right now for the most part. Um, and both of those things being said, um, clinicians really have to weigh the risks and benefits um, for bringing a patient into the clinic for in-person testing. Um, and in cases where a clinician does feel that it's appropriate and safe, um, we're also still working around patient fears and anxiety. If a clinician might feel it's indicated for the patient to come in for testing, but a patient might feel scared about coming in. So, um, so we're working with both of those things. Um, also, um, our patients are experiencing um, even more than before um, a lot of um, work and financial instability and there can be temporary lapses in insurance coverage during this time so that's another potential barrier where a patient might avoid coming in for testing um, due to um, uh, an insurance lapse 
Um, and lastly, um, you know, there's a lot of focus right now on stocking clinics with adequate PPE and testing supplies um, where it's easy to forget about making sure you're stocking, um, you know, routine things involved with STI screening and treatment, the in-house medications, as well as the testing supplies. So just making sure that that's still um, maintained as an agency priority. Um, so now I want to go on and talk about some of the opportunities brought on, um, you know, during um, during all of this. So first of all, telehealth can be an opportunity, um, particularly for patients who might feel shame or embarrassment about coming into the clinic for testing um, due to stigma and may feel more comfortable um, doing a visit by phone or video. Um, and then we're, um, we're also rolling out mass drive-through testing across the state through our clinic. And we see that as a potential um, kind of uh, point of contact where a patient who might have fallen out of care, who's at high risk for STIs, might then re-engage in care and, and later have some opportunities for you know, sexual risk screening and, and, um, and testing. Um, and we're, um, as I'm sure a lot of you are, um, in the process of screening for COVID and discussing uh, risk reduction, there's a lot of conversations about harm reduction um, around COVID exposure. Um, while you know, acknowledging that most patients don't live in pristine isolation and have some social contact during this time, but finding ways to do that as safely as possible. And we think that those harm reduction uh, conversations can be leveraged into um, sexual health um, harm reduction conversations as well, um, both reducing risk um, of COVID exposure through sexual contact, but also um, STI exposure. Um, and lastly, just really, um, I think this, pandemic has made everyone think outside the box about how we deliver primary and specialty care. And I think that that potentially can spawn some innovative ideas about improving access to STI education, testing and treatment. Um, one that we thought about is um, telehealth visits for PrEP initiation. And also one that's maybe on the horizon would be more um, home STI testing. So what's on the horizon? I think Jeannie already hit, hit home a few of the points. Um, number one being access, always ensuring access and continuing to keep this as, a, this as a priority when addressing how do we get patients in who may be at risk for STIs or have an STI and need treatment. So one way we've considered uh, as an avenue for increasing access is that at many of our clinics across the state, we have urgent care providers who have specifically slotted uh, visit types where they can only be booked within 24 hours. So whereas maybe their primary care provider, or other providers they may be seeing can get booked out for quite a while, it's almost guaranteed that there will be a slot with an urgent care provider somewhere uh, across the state, but hopefully geographically close. Uh, and the idea would be to use these same day appointments to get someone in with an STI concern or for screening, get them in, get them seen, and get them treated if need be. Also, we've, we've discussed self-collection in depth already. Uh, and basically, we, we did the study of the rectal self-collection and we've sort of informally been rolling out self-collection of vaginal samples as well. Uh, working closely with our, our nurses that we work with who then tend to disseminate that information to other nurses and other providers and it creates this ripple effect. So informally, a lot of us are already doing self swab, uh, vaginal self swabs as well as rectal self swabs and we're looking to create an, um, and adopt an agency wide policy and guidance around this to make sure that everyone's aware that we can do this and that it's available at all of our sites. Also, uh, it's funny to have expedited partner therapy as a next step when it's sort of taught as this cornerstone for STI uh, treatment, uh, especially in public health. However, I think that in reality, it's actually a lot more difficult. There are a lot of other factors consi to consider when trying to carry out expedited partner therapy. So as a prescriber, to do expedited partner therapy, I give a prescription to someone that may not be my patient, may not even be a patient of our organization, and I may not know anything about their health or their concerns. And so there are some safety uh, and some even uh, insurance concerns, there's licensing concerns, 
uh, when you're prescribing for someone that, that you're not seeing that's not your patient. And so we really want to make sure that we're, we revisit expedited partner therapy because it is such considered such a cornerstone, but it, it has posed quite a challenge to really carry out. Also, rapid STI testing. So going back to access, you know, STI treatment, identification and treatment is all about access and treatment, treating as quickly as possible. So what better way than to have a same day appointment with a rapid test and get your results immediately. So we already have access to HIV and hepatitis C tests that are rapid. However, we'd like to look uh, at obtaining or, or, or looking at the syphilis, gonorrhea and chlamydia rapid tests. Also home testing kits in the age of telehealth. I think it's, there's no better time to roll this out. Sending kits to, to the patient home and letting them drop them off uh, at their convenience is an excellent idea. Hopefully decreasing barriers, decreasing the stigma and improving uh, the rate at which we actually get these screening tests done. And finally, uh, using our nurses, continuing to the, use them to the, to the uh, greatest expanse of their, their scope of practice, which we really tend to do at the Community Health Center um, as an FQHC. We already have the standing orders for many STI screening uh, tests, and so why not expand that to prep initiation and follow-up? Our nurses are constantly in contact with our patients. They often have a lot of access as well for getting patients in for visits. And we also have a lot of open communication between nurses and providers, whether it's through our internal messaging system, phone calls, or, or being face-to-face. -face. We all work together in pods, and so I think that this is a great way to collaborate and allow nurses to expand further, start PrEP, and, and continue to prevent uh, HIV infections. So in summary, uh, we know STI rates are continuing to rise, and that in order to stem the rise, we need to scale up screening and education uh, in primary care and Ryan White clinics. We need to look at ways to streamline the sexual risk assessments and training. We need to increase focus on extra genital testing and, and making it more easily adopted in clinics by perhaps using self-collection testing. We need to examine more the use of nursing and STI screening and, and look at other innovations such as same day access. And given the age of COVID, you know, find ways to ensure that STI screening does not suffer, right, by looking into home testing and the use of telehealth. Lastly, although this talk did not focus on the disparities, we must acknowledge and address the racial and ethnic disparities in STI rate. And we need to continue to innovate, study, share with each other what is working and what is not working in our clinics so that you know we can learn from each other and really adopt what does work so we can truly stop this rise of it thanks very much